I'm choosing this morning which one uh, that the Lord felt like the Lord wanted me to sing. Um, but this is something that he's been speaking to my heart about. Um, I tend to run to the highs and the lows and uh, maybe I guess you'd call that just drama <laughs> sometimes. Um, but faithfulness is key. Um, just walking with him every day. It's not always a, a run. It's not always a sit down. It's just walking faithfully every day. And that is sometimes feels more difficult <laughs> than surviving the great battles of life. Um, but he helps us to stay faithful. Jesus wants to keep us in his care. Everywhere we go, he's always there. He can give us joy beyond compare, walking in the goodness of the Lord. Keep walking with the Lord all the way. Keep trusting in his word every day. Keep looking for the sun. Watch and pray, keep walking, trusting all the way, looking, trusting, praying every day. If we follow Jesus, he will lead. He will then supply our every need. Absolute success is guaranteed, walking in the goodness of the Lord. Keep walking with the Lord, all the way keep trusting in his word every day keep looking for the sun watch and pray keep walking trusting all the way looking watching praying every day jesus is our savior god and king we can look to him for everything after all he's done, let's shout and sing, walking in the goodness of the Lord. Keep walking with the Lord all the way. Keep trusting in his word every day. Keep looking for the sun. Watch and pray. Keep walking, trusting all the way. Looking, watching, praying every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. I appreciate that. Keep walking with the Lord. Keep looking to Him. Amen. Wonderful song. Well, if you'll have your Bible open to Exodus chapter number 20, Exodus chapter number 20, once again, we continue in our study in the uh, Ten Commandments. If you would, as you find that, uh, just say amen and then let's stand together. Amen. And uh, we'll look at the Eighth Commandments in verse 15. But let's remind ourselves of the commandments heading up to this. Uh, we have commandment number one in verse three. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse four, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Verse seven, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse number 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, verse number 12, honor thy father and thy mother. And verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then verse number 15, our commandment for our study today, thou shalt not steal. The eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the Word of God. And Lord, we thank you for your commandments. We thank you for your law. And Lord, we thank you for how you've already blessed us with the good fellowship, the good congregational singing, the wonderful special song that you've blessed our hearts with. And Lord, truly, in our hearts, we want to look to you. And we want to walk with you. And Lord, we know that your commandments will help us in doing those things, especially in walking with you to obey your law, to obey your word. Help us to learn today, Lord, we pray, by the preaching of your word and by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Lord, we pray once again, as always, that our desire would be to see souls saved and lives to be changed. And Lord, that you'd send us a real revival. Well, thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Talk about the Eighth Commandment today. I'll remind you of kind of a premise that we've set 
in the study of the Ten Commandments, and that is that statement where we said that the Ten Commandments are not rules that have been given to burden our lives, but what the Ten Commandments are, they are principles to govern and to guard our lives. In other words, God has given them to us because He knows what is best for us. Amen. And so He gives us the commandments. God has given us His law. And think with me about this. We, I know there are people in the, uh, today's world that would want to contend with this thought or this understanding and, and would try to disagree with it. But uh, folks, for man to function in human society today, you've got to have law. Amen. You, without law as anarchy, and you can't have that in a nation or in a community. In fact, a community of people, whether it's a town or city or, or, or a county or state or the nation as a whole, a community of people cannot exist without law. Law is something that we must have. Now, we know that there is God's law that has been given to us and, and provided for us in the Word of God, in the Bible. And then there is man-made laws uh, that we have in our government, uh, national government, local government, man-made laws. We know we've got, the, we've got both. And understand this, for our society to function properly, it is necessary to have both of them. we got to have both. You have to have God's law, and you must have man's laws, man-made laws in the society as well. You've got to have both. But understand this, God's law will always supersede man's law. Amen. God's law is always has the priority. God's law must always come first. God's law must be the foundation uh, for man's law. And if we'll review a little bit of some of our history, we must realize and understand and, and confess that American law was originally founded upon God's law. You say amen to that. I'm talking about just you know our nation here in America today. Uh, let me give you some notes from history. Uh, the man Noah Webster, we get our dictionary, Webster's Dictionary. Noah Webster was one of the early uh, people in the early days of the life of the nation. Noah Webster was quoted as saying this, the moral principle and precepts contained in the scriptures ought to form the basis of our civil constitutions and laws. That's what they said. That's what our leaders said in the beginning in America. America originally was founded on God's law. We have a historical document that is called the Rhode Island Charter of 1683. All the way back to the time of the early colonies, 1683. And in that charter for Rhode Island, here's what the people that founded the, uh, uh, the, the place of Rhode Island, uh, the people that founded that, they, they chartered in 1683 and they said this, we submit our persons lives and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of His given us in His holy word. That's the way uh, Rhode Island started. That was their charter in 1683. And, and when it says those perfect and most absolute laws, they became the basis for the Declaration of the Independence. And then from that, also, the Constitution of the United States. In fact, when you read actual historical documents, I'm talking about true history, I'm not talking about changed history that we've got today. Uh, I'm talking about true history. When you look at actual historical documents, uh, you will find out that our forefathers understood that civil law had to be based on moral law. We've got politicians today that want to rule out moral law altogether. And in fact, I'm very concerned because some of the statements uh, that I've heard and have seen, uh, I I'm concerned that we've got a, a president today that cares nothing about morality in our nation or a moral law. But the forefathers did. 
Our history uh, uh, includes the moral law and the dependence upon it. Daniel Webster, Daniel Webster was known as a, a very great lawyer of the 19th century. He was a congressman, uh, a statesman in the early days of America. And Daniel Webster said this, our ancestors established their system of government on morality and religious sentiments. Moral habits, they believe, cannot safely be trusted on any other foundation than religious principle, no, nor any government be secure which is not supported by moral habits. The Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal, really is vitally necessary for human government. It is necessary for our law. It is necessary for our government. It is necessary for our nation. Because you see, the application of it is to the right that we have of ownership of personal property. And God has given us a moral law, but God also has ordained human government. Romans chapter 13 if you remember what the Bible says in Romans 13, and I read a little bit beginning with verse 1. Romans 13, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, you could use the word government there, but it resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For, for, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom uh, honor. And so God has established human government. And God has ordained that there be uh, that there be laws of a nation and of a community. And so this eighth commandment, it is necessary for this. The purpose of the government, according to the Bible, as we've read in Romans chapter 13, the purpose of the government is to protect the lives and the property of its citizens and to punish those who would do evil toward anyone's life or anyone's property. That is the whole purpose of government. That's what it is meant to be. That's what God has ordained it to be. And so the, the commandment, thou shalt not steal. We must understand that it is foundational to human government. And, and to understand that, I think we just need to deal with the quest, question today, what does it mean to steal? What, what does God's word declare? What does it mean to, to steal? Thou shalt not steal. Well, there are a couple of things, two or three things. First of all, uh, to, uh, to steal, it, it means this. It, it means that without permission, you take from someone else. Without permission, you take from someone else. That's a simple definition and understanding of what it means to, to steal something. And, and, and think about this. How do you obtain possessions in this life? The things that you have, the material possessions. How, what are the ways of obtaining possessions? There, there's really only a few ways. You either work for it or it is given to you. You and I both have things that are, are, are possessions of ours, things that are important to us, that, that somebody has given to us and blessed us with. You work for it or it's given to you. Uh, or, or you could say that, that you have some things maybe that you found. Uh, all of us probably have got some things in our home that, that we found you know, somewhere one day. But uh, uh, the, the only other way then besides these ways is to steal it. <laughs> 
That's the only way, these are the only ways you get possessions. You either work for it or it's given to you or you find it or you steal it. And in Rome, or Ephesians rather, Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4 verse number uh, 28. The Bible says this. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. And so we obtain possessions by working for it, or it's given to us, or, or maybe you maybe you find it, uh, but the only other thing left would be to steal it. And the Bible says, steal no more, thou shalt not steal. Instead, work for what you have. Earn what uh, what you have and work for it and earn for it that, that you can do what? Well, that you can give it to somebody else, that you can help somebody else along the way. And, and so it's a foundational thing for human government, the problem with stealing. And, and trying to answer that question, what does it mean to steal? What well, it means that without permission, you take from somebody else. And, and but uh, the problem with stealing really is the problem of no respect. You all write that down. That's what stealing really is. The root of it. It is the problem of no respect. It, it, if when you steal, to, a couple things here. When you steal, you have no respect for your neighbor. No respect for your neighbor at all. You don't care about your neighbor. You don't care about anybody else when you steal from them. And so when you steal, really a, a root problem is no respect for your neighbor. Back in Romans chapter 13, once again, back in Romans chapter 13, we read verse 1 down through verse number 7. But let's, let's read beginning with verse number 8 now. Romans chapter 13 and verse number, uh, verse number 8. And, and notice what it says down through verse 10. He says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet him. And, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, now watch this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law problem with stealing is, is when you, you have no respect for your neighbor. You don't care for your neighbor. You don't love your neighbor. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter number 22, and you remember these verses here beginning with verse 37 where Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. But he says you love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. In James chapter 2 verse number 8. James said if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself ye do well. And so a real problem with, with stealing is that when you do it, uh, it just shows that you have no respect for your neighbor. You don't love your neighbor, uh, as the Bible tells us that we're to do. But then, along with that, we can also see that when you steal, you have no respect for yourself. You have no respect for your neighbor, but you also have no respect for yourself. Because Jesus said in that great commandment in Matthew 24, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Remember that? Thou shalt, doesn't just stop there, love your neighbor, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so if stealing, uh, uh, taking something without permission from someone really reveals no respect for your neighbor, well, the words that Jesus uses, it also tells us, well, there's no respect for your own self. Because when you don't respect your neighbor or your neighbor's property, you are hurting yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And so in other words, dear friend, you never gain when you steal, you always lose. Amen? You never gain when you steal, you always lose. And if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian and you steal... You don't respect your neighbor. You don't love your neighbor. If you're a Christian and you steal, you lose your witness and you can forfeit 
and lose your testimony. And it, and it hurts the witness and the testimony before your neighbor. When you steal, you have no respect for yourself. And when you steal, you have no respect for your neighbor. And so that's what, why this commandment is so important, so foundational to our, our national law, our, the law of the nation, the law of the land. Uh, it, without, it means that without permission, you take from somebody else. But then the second thing that it means, what it means to steal also is that you are withholding what belongs to someone else. Not only that you just take something without permission from someone else, but when you withhold from someone uh, something that belongs to somebody else. And so what do you mean by that? Well, it, it means not paying what you owe. And when, and when we do not pay what we owe, we're, we're just as guilty of stealing as if we broke into somebody's house and, 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 and took their possessions. You see, and the truth, it's not paying what you owe. And the Bible teaches us we do owe something. In fact, there is something, according to the Bible, that, mark it down, that we owe to everyone. Something we owe to everyone. Romans 13 again. Romans 13, verse number 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth uh, another hath fulfilled the law. We do have something that we owe. We owe love to our neighbor, love to our family, love to the people around us, and, and, and that we owe this. And it is the same thing as breaking into somebody's house and stealing their possession when we fail to, do, to carry out what we owe, when we fail to love. In John chapter number 13, John chapter 13, and you remember these two verses, verse 34 and verse 35, Jesus speaking to his disciples and of course speaking to us as well. And he said, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. And so we emphasize that. How, how can you give the evidence that you are a Christian? How can you show proof that you are saved? Well, uh, you obey the Word of God. There are some things that we could talk about, but this is one way. You can give evidence that you're saved by how you love your brother, how you love your neighbor, how you love your family, how you love your church, how you love people. You can give evidence that you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, when, when you love. And so here's, here's the thing about thou shalt not steal. If you don't love, then, according to the Bible, you are stealing. You're a thief because you're not paying what you owe. Jesus said you're to love one another. Paul in Romans wrote and said, Owe oh, no man uh, anything but to love one another. We're, we're to love each other. James said that that's how you fulfill the royal law is when you love one another. And, and so if you don't love, then, then it just fits together. You're guilty of breaking that eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. You're not paying what you owe. Again, Romans 13, 8, owe no man anything but to love one another. We owe that. But I think the worst form of stealing, the worst form of stealing uh, today it would be this. And that is your uh, worst form of stealing is when you steal from God. To steal means that you, without permission, you would take from someone else. And to steal means that you are withholding what belongs to someone else. And we've already seen, the Bible says, we, we owe love to everyone. So when you don't love, you're stealing. You're stealing what the Bible says you owe to that person. But the worst form of stealing that there is, and perhaps, the, uh, and, and perhaps one of the, maybe the, the greatest way that this commandment is broken today is when you steal from God. And so I ask the question, are you a Christian? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you claim to be born again? If you were to die today, do you know that you'd be in heaven? Are you a Christian? Well, if so, then understand that you belong to God. 
Can you say amen to that? You belong to God. And, and there's two, three things I want you to uh, take note of here. As a Christian, you belong to God. And, and so you steal. You actually are guilty of breaking the commandment. You steal from God when you withhold your devotion. You belong to Him. And when you withhold your devotion, you're stealing from Him. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and these two verses, verse 19, verse 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. And therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, which are God's, which belongs to God. The Bible says your body, your spirit, does not even belong to yourself as you become a Christian. It don't even belong to yourself anymore. It's been bought with the price of the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot on the cross of Calvary. It's been paid for. You've been redeemed, uh, delivered from your sins. And, and so the Bible makes it very plain. You don't even own yourself as a Christian. God owns you. You belong to Him. And so you steal from God when you withhold your devotion to Him, you say. Because according to the Bible, you're His. You're His. And really, think of it like this. You are God's possession. Talk about the Christian now. You're God's possession really in a twofold way. Number one, you are His by creation. He made you. Amen. <laughs> he made you. You're his, his by creation. And then number two, as a Christian, you are His by redemption. He saved you. Amen. He made you. Created you. He saved you. He redeemed you. Jesus Christ died for you. He paid the ultimate price for you. You are His purchased possession. And so understand this as a Christian. When you live only for yourself, and, and you have no devotion to God, when you live only for yourself, you are actually guilty of stealing from God. You're, you're, you're keeping from God what is, what is His, what He paid for, what He purchased with the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Think about it. You walk in His earth. You breathe His air. And when you live a life that He gave you without being totally devoted to Him in worship and in service, then according to the Bible, you're a thief. You're stealing from Him what, what, is, what was His. That's why the Apostle Paul, I think, wrote, I, I think the way that he said it, the way he wrote the words in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren. He says, I beg you. Must have been something that was, that was heavy on his heart. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says, I'm begging you, give your body as a living sacrifice. And I think the basis of that is his understanding that for the saved, for the Christian, our body even does not belong to ourselves, it belongs to God. And why would he say that you would give it, give it to the Lord as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable act of service. It's a reasonable thing for you to do. Why? Because it don't belong to you, it belongs to him. It belongs to God. And Paul, it seems like with a burdened heart, says, I, I beg you, child of God. I beg you, Christian. Why don't you give your whole self? I think he's talking about your devotion. And when you lack that devotion of giving yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice, when you lack that devotion, it, 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 the bottom line, it is stealing from God. Keeping back from God what actually belongs to Him that He had actually purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And so you steal from God when you withhold devotion. And then also, you steal from God when you withhold your tithe. Go ahead and say amen or oh me, but you probably could have been thinking, well, I know that's coming. But you steal from God as a Christian when you withhold your tithe. 
And we tithe because. You say, well, well why, do, why do we do it? And, and, and I tell you, it's one thing I'm so grateful for and praise the Lord for. Here at Grace Baptist Church, I believe, uh, our people believe in tithing. Uh, there, there, there's no doubt in my mind about that. But you steal from God if you withhold the tithe. I, I may be speaking to somebody that catches this message online and, 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 and you would say, yes, I'm a Christian. I got saved. You used to go to church. I'm just not going to church now. Well, how long have you been out of church? How long have you quit church? Let me ask you this. If you've not been in church, have you been tithing? Have you been giving your tithe? Most likely not. And we know that from experience in the lives of others and lives of those in our family. But, but why do you do it? The question would be, well, why do I need to do it? Well, we tithe as Christians because it is really, it is really symbolic. It is symbolic of the fact that everything we have belongs to God. He doesn't require the tithe. He doesn't tell us to tithe because He needs it. He has it. He, everything is His. Uh, tithing is just a, a symbol of the fact that we recognize and understand that we everything everything we have belongs to God. And, and listen, the, the whole issue, the whole thing is, is, is not just about the 10%, which is what tithing is, is what the meaning of the word in the Bible is. But it's not just about the 10%, but the whole thing about it, uh, it's not 10% that is His. The whole thing about it is everything is His. And when we, tithe, when we tithe, what we're doing, we're recognizing that it's 10% is not His. Everything is His. And He is simply, He loans us back 90% that we can live on. That's a good deal. Uh, God really offers us a good deal. It all belongs to Him in the first place. It's all His. But all, all He says is to test our obedience. He says to, to give the tithe and, and we get 90% back to live on. Malachi chapter number 3. You know the text, Malachi 3. And uh, the Bible just makes it plain where this fits with the commandment, thou shalt not steal. Malachi 3, beginning with verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. That's how you rob God. Along with keeping back your devotion to Him. In tithes and offerings, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Amazing thing about it is, God says, look, if, you, if you'll do it, if you just obedient to the word, he says, then, he, then he's going to bless you. And I suspect that, that, uh, uh, that you've experienced that yourself personally in your life. I have. We've experienced it. When we were young in the faith, my wife and I, we, we, we had not learned about tithing to begin with. But I'm telling you this, when, when I did learn, and when we learned to practice it, practice it, I know that God blessed us more. And God provided more. There's so much more that it would get it would get to the point that okay you give the 10 percent you give the tithe you know that that's what you need to be doing to be right with God to be obedient to the, the word of God and then all of a sudden it seems like you're faithful in that and then there comes along the way that that you feel like well you know I'd like to I, I need to give a little bit more and so there's a special need there's a missions need. Maybe there's something within the church where there's an extra offering, a building fund, a project, or, or something else uh, that is needed. And so what do you do? Take that from your tithe? No, you go ahead and give a little more. And I've learned from my own experience, and I, and I trust that you have too, that as I'm faithful to giving to God that tithe, not because that, that just because that that 10% is His, but because I recognize that all of it is His. And to have His blessings, He, he does uh, give me the, the requirement, the instructions that as a child of God, I, I bring the tithe to Him. And so when I do that, it, it just, I've noticed in my life, it just seems like, well, there's something that I, 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 I'd like to give to help this. I'd like to give to missions. I'd like to give that. And God just seems to keep on providing to enable us to get it is an amazing thing. You know, the people that don't know the Lord and then the people who claim to be a Christian and they don't know uh, tithing. 
It, it's amazing to me what they're missing, what they're missing on. It's just you say, well, how does it work? I can't explain to you how it works other than that there's a window opened up and there's blessings that's being, being poured out from heaven. And so you steal from God when you withhold your tithe. And then the final uh, thought today, when you steal from God, now watch this, when we're talking about this commandment, thou shalt not steal. And how that it is foundational to human government. That God has ordained human government for what purpose? For the, uh, uh, for, for the protection of its citizens and of their property. Uh, that, and to punish those who would uh, do wrong, those who would steal or those that would hurt. Uh, that's the purpose of, of government. And so thou shalt not steal. It, it really is foundational to our understanding of what government's purpose really is all about. And so to steal, it means that without permission, you take from someone else. And when you steal, you have no respect for your neighbor and you have no respect for yourself. It means to withhold what belongs to someone else. And the worst part of it is when you steal from God by withholding your devotion and by, and by withholding your uh, time that belongs to God. But then finally, when you steal from God, you're actually stealing from yourself. You, you, you're actually losing. And you say, well, how do you figure that? Well, how about Matthew chapter 6? And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is speaking. He goes down kind of through a list of, of things that we need. You need food. You, you need a place to live. You need, a, you need clothing. These things that everybody needs. And do you remember how that in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Jesus kind of summed it all up when he said this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so the principle would be this, if we're not seeking God first, if we're not seeking the kingdom of God first, uh, we're really stealing from ourselves. Because we could lack some of the provisions and the blessings of God when, when, when we steal from Him. He, he's not losing anything. When we steal from God, we're the ones that are losing. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible says this, Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins, listen, your sins have withholden good things from you. You see, dear friend, if you uh, would be sure to give your devotion, your life to God, if you would be sure to uh, practice the biblical mandate of tithing and recognizing that all you have has come from God, if you'd be sure and do that, then God is going to provide for you. But, he says, your sins have withholden good things from you. There'll be things that you will miss. Things you could have had that you don't have or you, want, or you won't have. Because, so really it comes down to you. You steal from yourself. And so you remember what we said at, at the beginning? You never gain when you steal, but you'll always lose. You never gain when you steal, but you'll always lose. Now, let me say this to somebody that if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, maybe you're catching this message online. But you know, the thing about it is, uh, you, 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 never, you never gain when you steal. You're always going to lose. And the thing about it is, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And he shed his blood for you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, and that means you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when you choose to go through life and reject the gospel of Christ, reject Jesus Christ, and you will not receive Christ as your savior, you know what you're really doing? You're stealing your soul from God. He died that you might live forever. You steal that from him when you refuse to accept his son and to believe the gospel.
And when you and, and listen, when you steal that, when you steal your life away from God like that, then you lose. Because the only thing is left is your soul is lost. And it's lost for eternity. And it can spend an eternity in, in, in the fires and the torments of the place called hell. When you, when you steal yourself from God, you, you lose. You lose every time. And you lose big. Don't keep yourself from the Lord. Trust Him as Savior and Lord of your life. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, church. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed for prayer. We'll pray together. And we'll have a song together. But let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you for your commandments. Thank you for this eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. It's, it's really foundational to, to, to human life, the human government. And, and the principle applies to our lives, especially as believers that would desire your blessings upon our lives. And Lord, we pray for someone today that, that perhaps has never trusted you as Savior, they, they've never been born again. Lord, help them to realize that if they just go through life and reject you, that they in actuality are, are stealing their soul from you. And they're losing everything. They never gain anything by, by rejecting uh, the Lord Jesus, but they lose everything. Lord, we pray you'd help someone today to turn from, uh, turn from that and trust you and be saved today that they might call upon the name of the lord and be saved by faith believing and lord for that would give you the glory and thank you for all you do in jesus name we pray amen amen well, let's sing a song together church and brother tim leads us amen page 271 